This is the bite size PD for our Kaibot integration, our science integration that we are doing in elementary schools. So my name is Cynthia Lloyd. I'm the elementary science and STEM specialist for Canyon School District. I work very closely with Chandra Martz, um, who is a, one of our digital teaching and learning specialists. Um, we've collaborated on this project in order to have the integration um, be in all of our elementary classrooms. So our learning intention for today is I can explain how to use the CESD Kaibot lessons and the Kaibot resources to set up and facilitate an unplugged coding challenge. And the success criteria is I'll know I've got it when I can access my Kaibot lessons and use the correct coding sequence to complete a challenge. So this is what a Kaibot looks like. Um, it is the first hybrid robot, which means that it can be unplugged or it can be used with Conundrum Lite or Conundrum. It is um, there is a vertical alignment piece that it can be used from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade. We will touch on just a few of its capabilities in our um, elementary grades. Our Brain Booster teachers will be using this in Brain Boosters twice a year, and all of our K-2 through classrooms will be using it in their classroom as well. So some of the features, if you look at this image, um, you'll see the little yellow power strip switch that's on top. Um, it is the back of the robot. So when you set it down um, to be able to run its code and to move, just know that that is the very back part and it should be facing um, the person who's setting it down. So Kaiba also has a front speaker. The words and images will be right side up when students look at them or when you look at it as a teacher. On the back, on the underside, there is some wheels and there's also the charging dock pads, which we'll talk about later. They're those little yellow metal pieces that you see down here in the corner. Um, and then there is a downward facing camera that is used to sense um, what's happening on the different cards. So this is our Kaibot rotation schedule for 24-25 um, this school year. If you're looking at this in future years, um, you can always find this rotation schedule in your instructional guides. So if you'll notice this year, we are starting with second grade. Um, will check out the kit from their media center. After they're done with the kit, they will take it back to the media center and the first grade teachers will be checking it out and then it'll go to kindergarten, down to STEM Brain Boosters, and then the um, rotation will complete two times after that. Our kindergarten class will use these Kaibots during their end of year project, um, which is a integrated social studies, science, and computer science um, unit that we will introduce to you later. So some of the components with Kaibots, we have what are called Kai tiles that look like this in your classroom sets um, that you have for your school. You have Kai tiles going all the way from 1 to 60. Um, and I'll talk more about those in just a few minutes. You also have some charging docks um, that work really well with our Kaibots and their the capability and what they can do with these charging docks is really cool. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit later. You do have two sets of cards. There's one small little set that's in a blue um, packaging that is comes with your Kaibot in the Kaibot box. And then you have this advanced set of coding cards. I would combine those two sets together. And I also would take out to the advanced coding cards that you don't need, that students will not be using in elementary school. Um, they are things that are much higher grade levels um, because this little Kaibot can do math all the way up to high school level. Um, so just after you started using the kit, I actually combined my district training kit, the cards, and then I put them into Ziploc bags instead of trying to put them back in the boxes to make it easier for students. I also have had some teachers that I've had training with so far say that they would like to have um, all of the cards together and they'll put like um, each card, like let's just say it's a number card, all the threes together on the counter, um, all of the four words together on a counter. So if students need those individual cards, they just go pick up those cards. So however you want to organize that for your classroom is okay. There is a conundrum light um, and a conundrum feature which uses the iPad for conundrum light and a computer for con the conundrum application and we will be doing a training a little bit later in the year on conundrum light because some of my second first grade teachers might want to use this with their students um, kindergarten teachers you wouldn't want to use it with students but you could use it 
to show students what it looks like as they're coding on the coding tiles with the coding cards, what it looks like in a virtual world. But we will not probably get our kindergartners onto that um, ever. And then again, of course, over here on the right, we do have our little Kaibot. So when you first open this box and um, get out the Kaibots for use in the classroom, you're going to want to make sure that each of the firmware is up to date. So with this, I just want to kind of show you the steps that we take um, to make this happen. So you're going to go to this link and there is a QR code that is in um, the white book that is in each of your kits. And I also have it on the lesson plans. So you're going to want to go to the Kaibot firmware. Um, you're going to want to connect to Kaibot. Um, in this case, when you push the connect button, there is a little part over on the left hand side that's going to come up. And as soon as you have your Kaibot turned on, you'll see that the little number will show up here and it will also show on the Kaibot. I'll show you what that looks like a little bit later. Um, you can only do one at a time, even though you may have all of your Kaibots on in the classroom. Um, you have 15 per kit. All 15 may show up here, but you can only um, use one at a time when you... Um, are updating the firmware. And I would suggest updating the firmware every couple of months. It doesn't need to be done every single time you get the Kaibots out, but you're going to want to make sure it's always running um, with the latest updates to it. So once you find the, the number of it, it'll show up right on the Kaibot screen and it'll also show up here. You're going to click on that number, you're going to push pair, and then it's going to go through just a very quick series of downloading. The very first time you do it, just because they were shipped to us and you haven't had them out of the box. It may take just a little bit longer. It might take a minute or two per Kaibot. Um, but after that, it goes very, very quickly to update. And it'll always tell you what the latest firmware version is. So if you see on the very first one that it doesn't need to be updated, don't try the rest because they're all going to be updated already. So I just kind of wanted to show you what that looked like um, so that you know that you have to do this every once in a while. Um, definitely at the beginning of every school year, I would make sure that my firmware was up to date. So it's going to usually always be the second grade teachers that have that. Okay, moving on. There are two charging options that you have. You can charge via the USB cable, which is the little white cable that um, came with the Kaibot. In, it's usually in a box with some wraparounds. Um, little holders that, that go with the Kaibot. I, I would highly suggest maybe not using those with students because they're really only for maybe a one-time use um, with an individual student and they're not sturdy enough to be used by the students. So um, one thing that you can do is charge through that white cable. It would go into the back on the micro USB charging port and directly into a charge. Um, the charger that we have given you is a black one that is um, able to charge six Kaibots at once, but there are other options which I will also show you later. So notice that there's the power switch here. If you move it all the way over to the right, you're gonna, your Kaibot is going to be turned on. It will go to sleep after 15 minutes um, of non-use and it'll kind of go over to the left just a little bit, but it won't be completely powered off. So to make sure that you are saving on um, battery life, at the end when your students are done, please make sure that those um, power switches are all the way to the left. It may look like it's done, but the minute they're touched, they'll wake themselves back up again and it will just be um, a problem with your Kaibots. So if you have two hours of charging time, that's worth about one hour of Kaibot use. Um, by one hour, it means one hour of it continually being used and not just sitting there. Um, most of the time you're not doing it for that long and the lessons that we have planned are definitely not um, designed around time that's longer than that. So this is the other charging option that you have is you can put these um, charging docks together. You'll notice over here that it's only plugged in once with the black plug that comes um, and that that would be plugged into your um, the charging unit that we gave you and then they're magnetic and they can be sat side by side. Notice that this little part up here will point an arrow to the charging dock so it needs to be actually um, on this side and down here that little arrow is pointing. This sets up against the tiles. Um, it can set up against the tiles and if the Kaibot is on its journey and the kids start a run with their with their coding sequence, if it gets low in battery life it will automatically come and find 
um, and move on to these um, charging docks by themselves. When it is finished charging, it backs up and it'll move off of them. So it's really cute to watch that. Most of the time you won't have to use that, but I would highly suggest you let your battery run um, kind of down one time um, in enough that you can actually see what this looks like in action. So if the battery is too far down um, or that you completely, it doesn't have a charge at all and it's not charging on these docks, you do have to plug it back into the white USB um, cable that came with it. So these can only be used if it does have enough of a, um, of a charge left in it. Okay, so the beautiful thing about these Kaibots is you can go from an unplugged concrete to an abstract coding challenge. So we start by teaching students the coding card symbols and actions through a human challenge. So you could show them a picture like this, and I've included these in your very first lesson for you to do with your students. Um, and then you can always review the second lesson that you do with them because there is a couple of months in between each time you're using this. You would tell students that you're gonna be trying to go from around this area. And you could even set up a little place in their, um, in their area where maybe they're moving around their desk or something like that, or just moving, um, having them all stand and then moving in a horseshoe type pattern. So as we do this, this is just another example of what you could show the students. As we're doing this, we are um, doing unplugged vertical coding. The reason why we like to do vertical rather than horizontal is we like it to match the Blockly that they're going to be using later. Um, our third graders have already had access to Blockly in their Brain Booster classes if they have been in the district. Um, but they, we want them to start seeing that we code vertically just like we code with Blockly and then with Python later. If we just do it horizontally, it doesn't teach students the natural connection into what the coding looks like, especially if we have um, like a sequence within another sequence, which this is showing that it's nested within the run program. So with this, when we, we always start with the record program card, um, you'll notice that this opens up our bracket. That bracket is synonymous with the run program over here. All of the coding will be within this bracket. So we start it here and notice that we're gonna to have to finish it and we'll talk about that in just a moment too. Okay, so after we have that one card, in order to move forward, you're gonna to have to place the forward card. Notice there's a little asterisk here. Um, this is gonna tell you that you need to move forward. If you don't have this green card here at the time, um, it will move forward one space just by using this card. Once you use a number card though, and the number cards, the green cards can only be used with cards that have that green asterisk. Once you use that, the Kaibot knows that they're not just moving one space, but now they're moving two spaces. So that would be two strides forward. That looks like two entire Kaibot's tiles forward. Um, so we're starting on this space and we move forward two spaces. Okay, if you place two number cards together, this means that this does not mean that it's going to move two spaces and then move two more spaces. It becomes an integer together. So in this case, it would move forward 22 spaces. So think about this. If this were the example, you have your forward card here and then you have a two and a five. How many spaces would that Kaibot move? Yes, it would move 25 spaces. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure your kids know that that does become an integer. Um, and you can even teach about place value with this. Okay, so if we're looking back at the square that was in one of the previous images that I showed you, the next thing we would do was turn right. So this is the Kaibot literally turning on one tile and it's gonna to go to the right 90 degrees. After that, we want it to, um, so we've started here, we've moved forward, two, we've turned, and now we want to move forward two again. And so we would have these cards um, coding. Notice that they are vertical. So um, we're going to continue this process until we get full circle and back where we started from. I would highly suggest you do this with your students in the classroom. You have your giant coding cards that we gave you and that we modeled at district day. Um, use those giant coding cards and do a like put them on your on your whiteboard or somewhere in your room so your students see what the vertical alignment looks like. It also helps to chunk out the different coding sequences because 
real programmers who work with computer programming, they don't do the entire thing and try it out and then go back and try to figure out where the error was. They chunk it in small chunks and make sure that that coding sequence works, works before moving on to the next coding sequence. So we're modeling best practices um, for students for now and for later. So Kaibot loves this card. Once you tap on this card, on the run program card, you have a three second countdown before Kaibot runs through your assembled program. Yes, I did say three seconds. So my suggestion is that you have the run program not near where the kids are coding. It should be next to one of the um, courses that you have set up. Um, and the, co the card should just be right there so that when a student finishes coding, um, their coding sequence, they go to the, the station where you have set up with the challenge course, and they're going to touch their um, Kaibot on the run program. And then they have three seconds to make sure it's facing the correct direction. The yellow switch is in the rear and always pointed towards them. And then they'll, be, they'll have time to do that. Otherwise, you're going to have kids trying to run across the room in order to get to the course within three seconds. So in order to use the, the Kaibot, and I'll, I'll show you what this looks like um, by modeling it later, but you're going to tap a card. You're literally going to set that, that robot on the card. You're going to lift it up about a half an inch, and then you're going to go to the next one and tap and lift. One thing that you should have students do is every time they tap it and lift it, they should look on the screen because the screen should match what's happening on the card. Um, if it's saying that they need to, to go forward, it will have that symbol with the forward on the card. Um, so if they aren't, if they don't get that, they will know that they have not um, coded that particular card. And so they'll be having a coding sequence error later. So this is what it looks like after you turn on your Kaibot and after you hit um, that, after you hit that first run program card, not run, the starting sequence card, um, it will turn to red, and this means that it will be available to scan the rest of the cards. Okay, so if you do not code correctly, let's say that you place a green card without a forward card or without an orange card with an asterisk, um, you're going to get a bug, and it literally looks like this on their screen, and we want then students to use the term um, that we have a coding bug because that's academically correct for our language um, in the coding world with computer science. And so if they get this program bu bug, they know that they have messed up their coding somewhere, that something is wrong and they'll need to go back and try to troubleshoot where that is. When you're first starting out with students using the giant cards, um, there are a couple of things that you can do to teach them to leave out a particular card on purpose and see if they can find where that is. If they move in the wrong direction or if they move before you, you do the run program, you're going to want to say, oops, we've got a program bug. There's a coding bug. Let's figure out why, um, our, why we're not doing what we should be doing if we were acting as human robots. So this is that end piece here that where we end the sequence, the brackets, you'll notice down here it completes the coding sequence. This card has to be in place before you do the run program. If this card is missing, um, you're going to get an error bug when you try to hit run program. So with the record program end, this is one of the top reasons why students will get the bug. Um, and so make sure that that is in place. Never tell students, oh, it looks like you forgot that. You would, you would always use an inquiry base and ask questions. What do you think is missing? Or can you look at your coding? Do you have a completed sequence? Um, when you say the completed sequence, students will learn that they have to have that initial one that opens up, and then we always have to have the one that closes the sequence. So again, this was the com most common coding error that there is. They need to make sure that they close that bracket and it closes the connections. Okay, once again, we always end with this card before they do the run program card. Okay, there is also a stop card that I'll show you later that is a good idea to have by the run program card. Um, it's so that if students start to run a program and all of a sudden the robot does something that they don't want it to do, they know that they don't need to finish, they'll tap it down on that stop program card and it just stops it right away. So this is kind of um, what our lessons are set up around. Um, this is one that is not 
one of the K through two lessons, but it's one that is available in Conundrum Light. So help Kaibot pick up the items he needs for his journey. Kaibot wants to visit a beautiful castle, but the route is far from home and is not very easy to get to. Kaibot needs to bring some items in his backpack to help him on his journey. So with that, with the coding, um, I've always included some authentic connections um, that goes with our wiser, with our, um, our writing, our reading, and viewing, our speaking and listening. And notice at the very center of this is our inquiry work. Um, we, we should never be telling students, this is how you code, this is the sequence that you do step by step. We want our students, even if they don't finish a coding sequence um, by in the amount of time, we want them to learn to troubleshoot and to problem solve on their own. So this is just a connection that goes with um, that castle, an ELA. One is have the students construct a story about traveling from one place to another. For example, why is Kaibot visiting the castle? What does the castle look like? And what does Kaibot see as he travels? Students can sit in a circle taking turns to talk about their experience or traveling, or they can write about it. Um, that does the speaking and listening and the writing does fit in with our ELA standards. Um, for math, in this case, you could practice addition. Look at the tiles and determine how many more tiles he needs to go to get to his de destination, um, which you could also do subtraction with this, or just practice identifying the numbers um, as Kai moves through the tiles. For arts, you can print out a blank map. Um, it can be hand-drawn, or you can just make squares um, that go with whatever course you decide to set up, and have students draw their own version of the story as it's happening. Um, this can also go along with their speaking and listening so they can present um, with the ELA one about what does the Kaibot see as he travels as they're showing um, the images that they have drawn on their map. Um, that is just a really good way to get your EL math and um, arts integrations in with this. They are totally optional. You do not think you have to do these authentic connections at all, um, but they might be fun for students, especially if you want them to do a writing piece in... Um, maybe a station or something like that during the ELA block. So there will always be materials that are listed that I'll show you where they are on the lessons. Um, when you lay out the tiles, you can either use the given tile arrangement or you can create one on your own depending on your student's need. You can modify more or less tiles um, to extend students and you can have your students create the challenge course and place the lesson images on them themselves. So these are all options that you can do. I want you to know that you can do um, even have two stations set up with the course. Um, even though you have the tiles one through 60, let's say you're using 10 tiles for your course, you can do one through 10 and the next one could be 11 through 20 um, and or through 21. And that will, when when the Kaibot sees 11 as a starting in, its mi in his mind, um, he's thinking that it is tile one. Um, for your students. So if you want students to practice different math skills, or if you just want two courses set up, um, maybe you want the sh a shorter one for students who might be struggling with this that might need a little extra support that you only use five tiles. And then maybe for the second one, you start at eight and maybe you use 15 tiles with it to extend students. So just know that you have the ability to adjust the tiles as, as fit. And this would just be what it looks like vertically um, done for students for this particular one. So I just wanted to let you see what it's gonna look like when they use their coding mats for this. Okay, I'm gonna show you a second grade example. There are task cards for most of your um, learning tasks that the students will be doing, most of their challenges. Um, and these are images that you will use placed around the mat. And I'm just gonna kind of show you what this looks like in our instructional guides. Hmm. Hang on, let me see if I can get us there. For some reason, our district was not wanting to have me go to there. Okay, so this is where you should have bookmarked already with your instructional guides. I am going to show you a second grade lesson. Um, the kindergarten and first grade lessons are set up just like this, but I want you to see where you're going to find them. You're going to go to science. Underneath the scope and sequence, you're going to have the year at a glance. And this is where you get to your... Um, CSD created lesson plans. So you're going to visit on the CSD science lesson plans and additional resources. It will bring up the second grade lesson and additional resources. If you scroll down, you will find the Kaibot integration lessons here. And if you scroll down even further, um, you'll find the lesson here along with some teacher training videos. 
that will be put in after I make your first one is going to be this um, bite sized PD, but there are also some others in there that will make your life a lot easier um, if you look at them. So you're going to click on for the very first one, the Kaibot integration lesson. It is going to bring up your lesson plan. Um, the approximate time needed is two days, 45 minutes each day. Um, so it should take both of your days that week. We have taken out um, keyboarding from your science block time. And so we have bought us six weeks that we did not have before. And so right now you're supposed to be starting science at the beginning of the year. Um, and you'll have plenty of time to fit these two days into your instruction. Um, if you follow the suggested pacing. So you're going to have your science standards here that go along with our seed standards. I've always included our Utah computer science standards so you can kind of see what students will be learning about and how we're integrating that with science. There's always the materials that are here. Um, I made a video with each of the lessons to kind of just show you what it looks like um, and just a basic coding video just in case you um, can't remember from time to time. So it's always good to review that. So um, underneath that, we also have a, a link to the giant coding cards. Um, you do have them in your packet, but if you did want to print and laminate more, you know, you have a link here for that. Um, there are also links to extra task cards, the animal habitat cards, and the special features cards that are used for this particular lesson. So if you find that your cards um, that we have created for you are getting kind of mangled um, over the years, you're welcome to print out more and get them laminated. So I always start out also with the learning and the success criteria that we've added. And then there's an overview and setup, um, a reminder to use the latest firmware. Um, it's right there as a link for you. In this case, it's best to assign groups of two students per Kaibot. Three is just kind of too many. If you have a larger class, um, so you have more than 30 students in your class, you will have to um, have three to a group, but two is what we found is the very best. So you're going to set up your course. Um, set up at least one course of Kai tiles if you want to see more than one set. Remember I told you you can set um, up them however you want. In this case, we have um, them set up in numerical order and notice how we have the image cards that are around. Um, they go along with the task cards and then we have the the run program card here, and this is the stop one that I told you about. So students will come over. The final card that they hit on is the run program, and then they have three seconds literally to line it up on the first tile um, and make sure it's going in the correct direction before it starts. If they get over here to five, and all of a sudden they know that it didn't make it to six and they need to start over again, rather than letting it run its whole course, they can come and they can just tap on that stop card and go back. Um, they don't have to do anything with the robot in particular. The minute they hit that start programming card again, um, it will automatically erase what happened before and they'll, it'll just start recording um, the coding sequence again. So this is kind of an overview of um, what you're going to introduce with the coding. Um, you're going to introduce those coding cards. You're going to go through, you're going to teach them about the bug. Um, you can use one of these two scenarios that you bring up with your students. And then you're going to talk about the features this first time lesson, just like I just did with you about um, what the Kaibot looks like, how to turn them on, how he runs. Um, I know that there are cars that, you know, the cars that students like will pull back on and then they'll move um, forward at their own. Don't let students do that with the, with the Kaibot's teaching that we, we don't have it move on its own. We literally need to wait until it moves. Okay, so you're going to run through how to tap a card with them, prompting questions to facilitate student-led problem solving. These are for your benefit. Um, what action does the blank card do? How many space tiles does Kaibot need to move? Is your coding sequence complete? Do you have a bracket at the beginning and a bracket at the end? Um, I would highly suggest maybe printing off those and just having them somewhere um, that, on a little card that you can carry around as you're walking around um, helping students and facilitating that. So common misconceptions, um, students will sometimes miss cards, remind them to make sure that after they code each card to look at the screen and make sure it matches the card they are coding and students will forget to use the end program card or the run program card. Don't tell them they forgot it. Say, hey, do you have your coding sequence complete? What cards do you need to make sure they're complete? 
So these are the authentic connections that I talked about where we have ELA, we have math, and we have art um, that are in place that you can use to um, extend students or to help um, build deeper connections by, um, by integrating the subject areas. So assessments, students understand as they are coding by roaming the room, um, that's what you're assessing students on. There's not a formal paper and pencil thing. Don't ever, don't ever assess them on whether they completed the course either. We want the understanding. Do they understand coding? Do they understand exactly what we were trying to teach during this particular lesson? Um, ask students why they use the coding cards and what they should expect the robot to do. Um, it's, we're not grading on the final product. We're grading on whether or not students are learning those computer science, um, the standards um, and what the academic language looks like. You can assess if students understand. Um, in this case, if I go back up to the beginning up here with this particular one, students are looking at um, what special features animal have. Um, like they would be given a giraffe and the giraffe has a long neck. And then what habitat does it have to go to? You can assess students as you're walking around on whether they understand that students would need to have um, a knowledge that the giraffe has a long neck so it can reach the leaves in the trees and the leaves, they need that for food um, in that particular habitat. So that's a way you can assess the science along with um, the other part. So that's the lesson in particular that I wanted to show you. Um, and I'm going to go on to other coding cards really quick. These we introduce kind of in your later lessons that you have during the year. Um, they are something that you can use and with students. They're really fun. Um, I have a little kindergartner that is um, my granddaughter and she loves these cards. She thought that they were just the greatest. Notice that the color card when you do the code for that, it does have a beginning bracket, which means it will have to have an ending bracket. This is where you make a coding sequence within a coding sequence. Um, the cards have what is happening on the back. These, um, you either, you kind of set down the kaibot and you either move up and it will increase the amount of red um, and down for a smaller amount of red. And you can have students kind of look at what happens when you mix red and blue together um, and play around with uh, moving the kaibot along the continuum to see what color they come up with and the lights do change colors on it. They can also do the same thing with how do I feel. Um, these are what the cards look like. The surprised one is my favorite. You'll want to maybe play around with that with students and see what that has to do. You can put these anywhere within the program. Um, they do not require, notice they don't have the bracket on it, they do not require the outside and the inside cards to be able to do that. Okay, there's also a movement card for a circle. Um, notice this is has the little green asterisks here. So when you place the this card and have the little green asterisks after it, if you were to put a two next to it, it means that it would move the radius of two. So when it starts out, the kaibot will be kind of along here. It's going to literally move in a circle that is about the size of two tiles. If you do 22, it's going to move in a huge circle that has the radius. So this part right here will be the number of tiles. So it's kind of a fun card for students to be able to also do um, when they're running their course. So um, there is a video here, Conundrum Light. I am not gonna show you that right now, but I wanted you to have the link so that you could go on and see this. Um, so if you get into the slides that go with this, it is kind of the version of what it looks like um, when it is in a virtual world. Again, I just wanted to get your feet wet with Conundrum Light because we will be giving um, PD later on this in the year, professional learning, so that you could use this with your students um, when and if you're ready this year. I am going to show you now um, what it looks like with the actual kaibot and tiles and what it would look like to run through um, a lesson and to kind of help students with that. Okay, so this is the Kindergarten Living Things Lesson 2 um, that I'm going to be kind of demoing here. Um, I set up my own course. I want you to know that the Kai tiles, they do work with the magnet tiles um, and it just kind of makes the course more interesting. So in this case, there are three task cards and the task is to help your Kai bot find how this animal changes its environment. We have a squirrel, a beaver, and um, a bee. 
you would give these to your students. This is where you can start to differentiate a little bit because if you wanted your students who maybe are just starting out coding and maybe need an easier course, you're gonna give them the B. And so I would make sure that the object that they're going to is a little bit closer. It can be put on a magnet tile like this and taped to it, or it can be, if you don't have magnet tiles, it literally can just be placed to the side, either one. So I'm just gonna put these three around. And you would wanna tape them in place. I'll just put this at the end of the thing over here. Okay, so students are gonna be working in groups of two. Um, the thing about having different task cards is that all the students might take a different course or they'll have a different way of coding, which is okay. The very first unit, we're gonna start out really easy. I'm just doing basic coding, especially with our little kinders. Um, after you have done the giant cards with them already in class, this is where you're gonna start using your Kaibot with them. So I did want you to show you the charging dock that's over here. I told you that you could easily um, put these together and you can line up quite a few of them. I had nine lined up at one time um, and was charging from them. It goes into this little um, anchor brand that we bought. Um, and then you can only have one cord coming with all of them lined up. Or you can also, if the Kaibot gets too low or if you need more um, space, they do go into here. And this part hooks into the Kaibot um, right here. So it would be hooked in this way to charge also. So the beautiful thing about these docks is that they literally can hook onto um, the magnetic tile. And if your Kaibot is going along and it is out of juice, and it needs gas, um, that's the way my granddaughter described it. Um, if it needs to charge, it will automatically, if you start the program, it'll automatically find its way over to the charging dock and go directly up into it. So remember when we are looking at our um, robot, the yellow on the back is the back part and the front part has the speakers in it. So in order to turn it on, you have to go all the way to the right and it needs to be pushed all the way over. There's like a little mini thing that it'll go back to after 15 minutes, it automatically um, puts itself into sleep mode. But just know that when you're done with them, they need to go all the way back to the left, otherwise you're gonna hear them chirping in your classroom. So you'll see that it's loading up. And I just wanna show you what it looks like when it gets on the little tile. This one I think, oh no, it is gonna go up to the charging. It just puts itself right on there. As soon as it's done and gets a charge, it will scoot itself right back out and be ready to go again. Um, most likely your students are going to have to use that a lot though because they will have, um, you'll have a charge for them, but it's cool to show it every once in a while um, so that a student knows the capabilities there. So once we have our, um, where we're going, we're now gonna start looking at how to actually code using the coding cards. So I made these Kaibot coding mats to help students organize and to do the vertical alignment. Remember from our um, original, or from when I started this Bite Size PD, we're always gonna start with the record program start card. Remember it has the brackets that we're opening up. That will be the very first card that we do. Okay, so over on the course, we would we, the kids would start it on number one. And remember I told you that the yellow is the back part. It's gonna always have to be facing them. I have placed my stop card here. Do you remember what that was for? That is if you, if like, if it came on, went only one space and they knew it needed to go two spaces, they could literally come over and they could lift it up and code that card and it would stop the action from happening. If you just hold it, um, it the, it's gonna have to continue its motions until it's done with the entire sequence. This is a way to quickly stop it. Um, I have my run program card here also. Remember that after you touch down on the run card and code that, you only have three seconds to get it over to the number one. So you can imagine a small hand having to code that and quickly get it over here. You're gonna wanna have this in that area. Your students are going to have the course set up or possibly another one. Um, you can differentiate by different courses, but they're gonna be coding with their mat in a totally different area. And so they'll code in a small group, um, come over and then they'll run the course. So this card and this card should always be here and not at their stations. So we're gonna start with the beaver one today. The task is to find how this beaver um, 
changes its environment. And we have this picture of the tree stump over here where it's chewed the tree stump. And so that's the one we're gonna be trying to get to um, for this particular task today. So over here back on my Kaibot coating mat, um, I know that I have my, co my, my Kaibot here. I'm gonna actually have to move two spaces. Now, you can have your students come over and look um, at the course. I had a suggestion by a teacher, they were gonna take a picture of the course and they were actually gonna project it up on their screen. And so students could look up on the screen, kind of see the exact same course set up and be able to code and come over and just actually do the course. Either way is fine. Um, it's good for your students to come over and look at the course and to try to problem solve from that point too. So remember when we talked about just chunking, um, that's the way that real coders, um, computer science people do their coding sequences, is they chunk and they, then they check their work before they move on to the next piece. So in this case, I know I'm gonna need to move forward and I know I'm gonna need to move forward two spaces. So I'm going to use the forward and the two. And then I'm gonna check my work. So remember, we go over and we touch the card and we come up. You'll see that it has the red scan. That's telling me I need to move and touch the next card. You'll see the forward. It looks exactly like that forward. And then I'm gonna do the number two. So I, if I were to run the program now, I'm gonna get a bug alert. Do you remember why I got a bug alert for this? Because your students are gonna do this a lot. We have not closed the coding sequence. If you remember, we start with a bracket and we always end with a bracket. So in this case, I need to have my run end program put in place. So I'm gonna go back and remember, I don't have to do any sort of clearing. It automatically clears itself the minute I push the start. I'm gonna record by touching and moving up, touching and moving up until I get to the end record. Then I'm gonna come hit the run program and you'll see that it's counting down and I have three seconds to put it into place. Then our car bot should move up two spaces. Okay, that's the end of that code so far. Um, so we need to continue. You'll see that we need to make a left, he needs to make a left hand turn here. And so he's going to go left by 90 degrees. And so I'm gonna start a new sequence. This is a new action. Think of the oranges being your action cards. Um, this is gonna be the very next one. And remember I said, if you just have the action card in place, it is it will move only one. If I put a number, it changes that to the value that is the number card. But I only need to move one space, so I'm gonna put one there. If your students put a one here, it's okay, but they may run out of ones. And in that case, it's a good idea to say, I wonder what would happen if you only put that card. I wonder what if it's gonna make a turn um, or what it's gonna do. So I'm moving and turning left 90 degrees, and then I'm going to put a forward card down. So it's turning 90 degrees and then it's doing forward. I'm okay if you put two actions here together, um, or if you wanna go down to the next row, I'm okay with that also. It is still um, considered okay if you have it on the same thing. So now I have another sequence, but remember that record program has to go down to the end. So I'm gonna take my Kaibot, start over again, and I'm gonna tap. Making sure and checking after each time that that is what showed up on the screen and that I'm gonna push my run program again. I have three seconds to put him on. And he's gonna run his course. You can use the Kaibot without the tiles themselves. You can set up like a little course in your room. Um, maybe a fun little obstacle course or something that students can do. But just know that it won't be exact. He might move maneuver off to the side and um, slightly sway to the side. These tiles keep him exactly centered. So if he for some reason were to kind of get off center, he'll maneuver himself to the center um, before he'll move on to the next tile. And he has exact perfect 90 degree turns when he's on the tiles. But they can be used um, just like with a masking tape course, which is kind of fun to have your um, kids design a course if you have time in the year. So I'm not gonna do this whole sequence. If your students run out of room on their um, Kaibot coding mat, they can take another mat and just kind of put it underneath to be able to continue their coding. 
So we included mats in there, or some students, once they have followed this pattern, they can just continue the pattern down here after the mat. So it's up to you how you want to show this with students. It's also up to you how big you want the course. If you want your kids just to do a small little course to begin with um, the very first time you use these, make the course shorter. If you need an extension, make it longer. If you have both um, levels in your class, have a short course and a long course and just assign those groups to the different course to be able to um, differentiate between them. But that's kind of how you use the Kaibots. Um, there are other things you're gonna be teaching students. Kindergarten, this is pretty much all you're gonna be doing, but first and second grade, you're gonna learn how to code within a code, which is kind of cool. I do wanna show you a couple of those specialty cards. Um, I'm gonna get my bag out here. Remember I told you I put all of my cards from the small deck and the big deck into one um, just to make it easier. These are the cards that are the feeling cards that I told you about. So they can be put in at any code. So let's say I wanted to put it there. When I got to that card, you literally, in order to get angry, you're going to hit and then you're going to go forward. Or if you want crying, you're going to hit and go backwards. Um, it just works out really nice there. That's one of the cards that I would, after time, show my students. Um, also, the color mixing cards, they are really cool. There is blue, um, green, and red that they can mix together. And this, remember, is a bracket within a bracket. So it's going to start with the color start. And then if I want to mix green and red together, I'm going to have to end that here and then put the record program at the end of that. Um, but that's how you would kind of show that within there. And then the other card that I told you guys about earlier was the one that does a circle. Let me see if I can find this circle. It's in here somewhere. There it is, okay. So if I did the circle, I would wanna have a radius with it and that's where you're gonna use your number cards. Um, remember the radius would be like if I put a three after it, it means that it's going to move over the, the length of three tiles and then make a big circle that goes around like this. That's why it would be really fun if you had like all 60 tiles down and they were together like this and you just had them blocked off by the mag tiles where it would be able to make the full 360 on um, the tiles or you can just do it on a floor. They do work on the carpet. Um, but they're not as exact and obviously if you hit like a, a really funky place on the carpet, um, it's gonna kind of veer off in a different direction. Um, but you can use it on that. Better would be if you found like a hardwood floor to be able to use it, um, like a gym floor or something like that. Um, or use the kite tiles for the exact. And that's basically how we code our robots. Um, hopefully your students will have fun with it and hopefully you will also. Um, they are, they're kind of addicting, so good luck. And if you need help, um, please reach out. Thank you. Well, I just want to say thanks for coming um, to this Bite Size PD. You can have relationship credit. Um, as always with these, this is how you submit for relationship credit here. Um, if you need any more support, please contact myself um, and Chandra or Chandra, either one, um, to come in and help you so that you are feeling comfortable with using these Kaibots. We don't want you to suffer in silence. They're fun. They're easy. Um, but they are a great resource to teach those computer science skills integrated with our science curriculum.